Hi, everyone, and welcome back to the Welby Show and Podcast. Uh, today, I have a very special guest, Tony Salimi. He's a best-selling author, award-winning documentarian, and has appeared on over 100 TV and radio stations across the world. He's also a TEDx speaker and the founder of TJS Cognition, a coaching, mentoring, speaking, consulting, and education and service institution dedicated to exploring and expanding the frontiers of human awareness and potential. Tony, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me on your podcast. I'm thrilled because as we were just talking about briefly uh, before we kicked off the live part of this interview, we're going to focus a lot today on loneliness. And you actually wrote a book on this and uh, you really believe in and uh, strive to connect the science uh, with sort of the effectiveness, but the mysteries, I would say, of uh, holistic healing and a lot of how, you know, what we do all day affects our chronic disease risk and also our ability to heal. And I know several years ago, the U.S. Surgeon General said that chronic loneliness was, you know, a huge epidemic in the United States and globally. And that always stood out to me because I didn't really understand the biology of that. Um, and how something like just spending time alone could influence, you know, chronic disease, like food, I get it, you know, you're, it's an input, but, uh, but loneliness is so interesting to me. And so in certain ways, easier to solve, or at least cheaper to solve <laughs> than somebody who, you know, just uh, can't access a functional medicine doctor or can't access, you know, herbs and supplements and things like that. I'm thrilled that you wrote this book because I've been looking for answers on this topic. Uh, first of all, how would you define loneliness? Many people, specifically introverts, you know, need time alone, I think, in order to recharge. So how can we find a balance between having adequate alone time according to, you know, each of our needs um, and being lonely? But first of all, you know, what is loneliness exactly? Because I know sometimes you can be alone, but not feel lonely, or you can be with somebody that you're not connecting with and feel lonely. So. I'd love to know what, what you have to say on that. Loneliness, like everything else in life, is multifaceted, which means you cannot really pinpoint exactly what loneliness means to a, a group of people. We can talk about existential loneliness. We can talk about personal loneliness. We can talk about financial loneliness. You know, we talked about earlier about food loneliness. So there are many forms of loneliness, but it's simply there are different states in our mind that can create that loneliness. And unless we really understand the psychology of loneliness, there's no way that that individual will actually, first of all, accept it that they are lonely. That is one of the bigger battles because most of us in today's world, especially during lockdown, we're actually being conditioned in a way to go against our very nature. And our very nature is we are social animals. Our very nature, we have a need to belong. Our very nature is we have a need to love and be loved. Our very nature is to connect one, with one another in meaningful ways. Although we are already connected with one another, it's just our psychology and our perceptions of lack of the co connection that exists within ourselves and with our environment and the universe as a whole. Okay, got it. Thank you. Um, so what happens in our bodies when we experience loneliness? How do these feelings develop? Can you talk us through the neurobiology as well as how that influences our pathways and our bodies? Because, you know, healing and, and staying well is all about, you know, having these clear pathways to detox and things like that. So going back to our body, basically everything in our body is already connected. Every system, every neuron, um, every cell in our body is connected. But we as individuals, we tend to even treat our body as a separate thing. We're trying to separate that which cannot be separated. On a daily basis, there are billions of information that our, our body uh, communicates with each other. Our nervous system will communicate with our gut. Our gut will communicate with our mind. Our heart will communicate with our heart and with our mind and with our soul. So there are so many different connections within itself and understanding how those connections work can help people move away from any form of illness. Why? Because the key to uh, bringing somebody into well-being, into a state of well-being, just like your podcast name is, it's about bringing the psychology in alignment with health and wealth. And, you know, 
Uh, the psychology uh, is uh, one of the things that I've been studying for the last 30 years. And how do we really bring uh, the mind, which is different to the brain, how do we sync the mind with all the different functions that the brain has, then, which then regulates all of our immune system responses? You know, we have the uh, parasympathetic and we have the sympathetic responses. And most of the, the also, there's a massive research out there, and I talk about in Hashtag Loneliness, my book, but also in my other books, the link between our psychology and our well being. But most importantly, the link between the way we perceive reality. Because the way we perceive reality is what actually triggers those uh, divisions within our psychology. And when we have divis division with our psychology, our cells will simply take the information you give it and the meaning you give it. And then we have the, you know, a lot of the information which is stored in our subconscious mind that automatically does a lot of things for you without you even knowing. You know, when I treat people, for instance, when people come to me with any form of health issues, whether it's uh, uh, the severe chronic issues or whether it's cancer or whether it's uh, heart issues, or it doesn't matter what the issue is, the body communicates to you specifically what that illness means to you as an individual. So therefore, when we have a prolonged ignorance to the communication that our body gives to us, we end up in a chronic illness, whether it's a chronic fatigue or something else. So now, uh, this is the key to understand that link. Why? Because every cell in our body is an opportunity to destroy or rebuild and heal our body. Now, when we know that and when we accept that as truth and we start really understanding how unifying ourselves and how objective thinking can transform your psychology, can transform your physiology, that's where the first step to creating a healing mind begins. And this is what I'm talking about in the latest book, which is the Unfakeable Code, just published, about the importance of objective thinking. I can never stress enough when you have an objective thinking, how your reality transforms, especially your health. Now, when I hear people, clients speaking about, I like this, I dislike this, that's not an objective thinking. That's a polarized thinking. When people tell me, I like this food, I don't like this food. And they have all those reasons why they dislike a food. I believe in the balanced life, meaning balanced psychology, balanced physiology, and balanced eating. Okay, so can you explain the effect that loneliness has on our bodies from, you mentioned, you know, obviously your mind, but your physical and then your emotional perspective. We know that chronic stress has an impact on the physical body and the emotional and the mental. And uh, I've been able to kind of visualize it in previous interviews um, with some gut health experts about how stress can actually loosen the, um, you know, the, the walls of the gut lining, which increases inflammation throughout the body. So that visualization, I think, helps people to understand like, okay, I can't just live in a stressful state. Like I'm actually loosening my gut lining. I don't want that, you know? So is there some sort of equivalent with how loneliness impacts the, the physical body? Absolutely, not just the physical body. I mean, loneliness, there's a lot of scientific research where I talk about the different research, how that uh, affects the immune system. Now the immune system, if you have a weak immune system or strong immune system, it's a great indication uh, that somewhere within uh, your reality, you have loneliness but also it's as dangerous as actually smoking 15 to 20 cigarettes a day. And also it's a, a, one of the a big causes a lot of people having uh, like heart issues. And heart chakra is actually associated with our ability to love and receive love. Now, you know, a lot of people, uh, let's, take, let's talk about something very specific that most people do in the world right now. When they don't get what they want, they withdraw. So that also happens in a relationship. When I meet uh, both men and women who haven't been in a relationship for a long time, they keep convincing themselves they are okay being alone. And only when I ask thousands of questions, they come to realize and they come to acknowledge and accept how much they would love to have somebody to love and be loved. But their initial response is, it's, I'm okay being alone. I don't need anybody. But that goes totally counterintuitive with what the body is designed to do. So we keep telling ourselves things like that, 
which in a way generates this invisible loneliness. And loneliness has been a taboo subject for many years. And the idea to write hashtag loneliness came to me after I published my first book, uh, Path to Wisdom, that became like seven times international bestseller. I started working with clients globally. And every time I traveled, whether in the airports, whether the restaurants I was eating, whether the countries I was visiting, or whether the families I worked with, people were glued technology to technology, but not to actual having meaningful conversation with one another. And I grew up in a culture in Northern Macedonia, where by the time you go from point A to point B, you met the entire bus or the entire train and people talk to you. And now what we're seeing this trend of actually it's become strange for you to randomly uh, strike a conversation with somebody you commute with. That on its own, it's a loneliness. You know, a lot of people have thoughts and ideas which may be contradicting to another person's uh, opinion and mindset. And therefore, instead of being able to have this objective way of looking at reality, they take it very personally and therefore they withdraw and they don't even share. Couples are very good at not expressing their opinions to one another, either from the fear of somebody leaving them or rejecting them, or frankly having an argument or whatever those things that happens between couples. So loneliness, when you look at every sphere, like some people have this spiritual loneliness, they have this need to connect to their own spirit. They have the need to connect to God, to universe, to whatever they may believe. And there's this gap between what actually they are to actually where they are trying to get to. So there's a many forms of spiritual loneliness that I've worked with people who are, for instance, people who become spiritual teachers and people who richly want to spend all their life doing spiritual teachings. Then we have mental loneliness. And mental loneliness is when you perceive you are alone in your mind with whatever is going on in your life. And therefore, you're not sharing openly or you don't have somebody who can simply listen without giving you any form of feedback. And we will use to, when somebody speaks to us, before they even finish the sentence, we already formulated the response. And that's yes. not what the person needs the most. Then we have emotional loneliness. And emotional loneliness, it's very, very dangerous. Why? Because your emotions regulate the entire body and also can actually uh, cause depression, chronic fatigue, stress, all of those emotions that have a massive impact in the way the body works and in the way it responds to outer. Uh, I would say stimulus. So even if you eat the most healthy of food, I've worked with a client who was a 100% uh, plant-based client. He actually developed cancer. At the point of developing cancer, he got in touch with me because we had a conversation before of this and he refused to simply look at life as life. And when we start creating those polarizations of saying this is good, this is bad, your body is trained to behave like that. So. Uh, for me, cancer, for instance, is simply the decision that you yourself at some point made you want to die, meaning that decision could be, I don't want to deal with this. I don't want to deal with this emotion. You might be feeling tremendously hurt, tremendously rejected, and tremendously alone in what you may be going through. And therefore, uh, because you don't have the tools, you don't have the clarity, you see the option of leaving the body or leaving this life as a solution to your problem. And there are many people out there who at some point in their life, they thought about committing suicide. And this is when the emotion that the human being experiences goes above the threshold for that specific individual. We all have emotional thermometer. How much of a sort of emotional bias we can uh, absorb before we go into overload and before we stress the body and before the body shuts down. And then we have career loneliness. You know, I, I do training in different uh, businesses, you know, and you have open plan businesses. Nowadays, people uh, communicate via email and they never even turn around to the colleague behind them and speak to them. Uh, I did a training exercise about how to improve sales in one of the company. And most of the team in the salespeople, 20 people, they did not know each other's name. They knew nothing about each other. And they were all focused on how to meet those targets. And therefore, communication was all via email, although they were sitting in one long desk. Then you look at the loneliness in society. You know, if you go outside, as I said, it's, it's not a norm anymore to strike a conversation without people thinking, what's wrong with you? You know, we somehow lost the meaning of connection and the meaning of loving and being civil to one another. And 
this is something huge and it is what the calling is. And I'm not sure if you read the hashtag loneliness, my book, but one of the inspiration is I come from North Macedonia. This is where Mother Teresa comes from. And I was blessed to meet Mother Teresa when I was a child. And, you know, she did a lot of work around loneliness. And one of the things she, she said about America, how rich America is, she said, America has become the loneliest country in the world. And that did strike me when I started working with clients around America, because I love America. You know, it represents everybody's dream out there. And therefore, I almost feel like I've lived many lives in America. And it's a duty for me somehow to contribute to the American people. And, you know, I've dated American guys and all of those things. But uh, the reality is this modern life, we have disconnected in an ocean of infinite connection. Oh my gosh. Yes. So we're going to have to talk about what we can do about all this. But before we do, because I'm just so fascinated in the visualization part of it, you talked about how loneliness, going back to the original question that we were just talking about in the beginning, the impact of loneliness on on the body, the physical body um, and chronic disease and symptoms comes from the connection to the immune system. And we know that 80% of the immune system is located in the gut. So is it a similar impact, it sounds like, that chronic stress might have, you know, on the yes, gut? They're all linked up. What people don't realize that uh, the form changes, but the actual working of the body is the same. You know, so when chronic gut responds to that, it's the same when our lungs respond to something that we breathe. It's right. the same when we put something in the food or in the liquid. Let's say you drank something or you ate something that does not agree with your gut your entire body want to throw it up. Or, you know, one of the things that I see in most of my clients who come to me, because I do this integrated work, both healing and business coaching, but most of my clients will experience in the middle of project headaches. So I'll put my hand into their head and I'll remove the headache instantly. But sometimes I don't put it in their head, I put it in their gut. And they were like, my stomach doesn't ache. I said, calm down, leave me for 10 minutes, you'll see it will go. And I actually work on their stomach. So the body is beautifully linked. We just treat it as a separate entities. And that's why, again, we have to go back into understanding the connection we have within the self. Now, I don't expect anybody to be a biologist out there. I don't expect everybody to be a doctor of their body. But still, there's a lot of information that specifically can help you as an individual, whatever you may be going through. But I always respond to people the importance of seek experts' advice. Because if we were able to literally get down to the problem ourselves, we would have done it already and we would not experience that issue. So I always encourage people, while it's great to research, while it's great to do that, go and seek experts' advice who can actually help you and hear you. Yeah, I think the listening is a powerful part about actually working with somebody because people in your life think they want to be helpful or that you're telling them something because you want them to give you a solution versus people that you work with, uh, you know, that you actually pay as a coach or as a, you know, as an advocate, they know that listening is a huge part of it and they can just take in the information before they try to tell you what to do. All right. So we know that loneliness, you know, has a direct impact on the immune cells, which are located in the gut and that everything is hyper-connected the same way that stress impacts the gut and impacts immunity. And so it's this impact with immunity that leads to this increase in chronic disease risk, which the US Surgeon General had mentioned a couple of years ago as being a huge epidemic and major global issue. But do epigenetics or do genetics play a role at all? Um, you know, as far as can feelings of loneliness affect our genes or turn on some bad genes that we might have? Yes, I talk about it as well in hashtag loneliness. I talk about it, how loneliness can activate and deactivate some of our genes. So although basically um, uh, the human body is a miracle, I say to people, you know, your body is a miracle. Start really accepting that miracle of God, no matter what God means for you. But also if you look about the genetic information that's been passed on through generations, our body has that genetic information. So therefore it's natural Although we have very little science, but there is science out there that now confirms that basically uh, um, uh, our genetics will have an impact how lonely we are. And some, uh, some cultures, we, they might have that loneliness factor a bit higher than some other cultures. Like, for instance, if you take Latin cultures, if you take Mediterranean cultures, people are more sociable. 
and the family unit is still uh, more stronger than in Western the world. In the Western world, we are actually, um, in a way, encouraged to be lonely. But at what price? That's the question I let the audience of this podcast think about it. At what price do our loneliness uh, impact us? So what is the price we're paying for saying to ourselves, we're okay being alone, we're okay being successful, uh, we don't need this, we don't need that, we don't need the, whatever it might be. At what price? I'm so curious, um, can you expand on, you know, we're encouraged to be lonely. What do you mean by that? Well, if you think about it, in uh, what's been happening over the last 20 years, we've been going into this self-empowerment uh, road. Little realizing that self-empowerment does not mean uh, you, uh, you, you being alone. Because a lot of people would use self-empowerment, as I mentioned earlier, the example saying, I don't need anybody, I'm okay. Now that on its own, it's a problem. And that on its own, it takes a, a good expert to ask you millions of questions without making you feel you are being influenced that you're not. And it's a very fine line how you do that. Why? Because the person who's saying that, uh, there's a whole history and the whole psychology behind and they have a reason and they have a meaning why they say that. Now, you know, if you take any animal out there, any animal out there, there's a moment where we need to recharge. And in that moment, you might need that loneliness, but not at the price of affecting everything else in your life and in your reality. Meaning, do you work at home? And are you alone at home? And, you know, uh, most entrepreneurs that I work with and coaches and consultants, author, people from different professions, especially during COVID, there was an increase in loneliness. Why? Because you don't have those social interactions. If you are an entrepreneur working for yourself, you know, you don't have the social interactions anymore. People tried via Zoom. But you know what? Uh, Zoom, while it might be a brilliant tool, it does not replace the power, uh, energetic power, the feeling the emotion, you know, the hugs that you receive or the handshake that you receive uh, with a person when you are there with that person. Why? Because our body, uh, with all these beautiful things, I talk about the human energy field, can actually absorb billions of information when you are with that person. And in hashtag loneliness, I already speak about in the chapter human energy field, how our body already communicates with a person before we even open our mouth. And therefore has the intelligence to whether we like or dislike that person, to whether we engage or disengage with that person. But mostly people have been, I would say, put in coma not to listen to that profound intelligence that our body as a unit has for you to use. Because also we bring down intuition now. Most people, when I speak to them, originally think they tell me my gut feeling or intuition. And after two hour session, they realize it's not their gut feeling or intuition, is their psychology and the emotional responses, which is very different to actually truly understanding intuitively what the body is, uh, the body is communicating to you. Okay, so in very simple terms, how lonely do we need to be in order for negative health impacts to actually you know, begin to happen? Because all of us spend a certain amount of time alone. Like you said, the pandemic kind of forced more loneliness, but also just time alone or time you know, in isolation, but it was this defined time. So I'm wondering, you know, was the defined time now that we're sort of, you know, coming out of it uh, enough to impact our physical bodies and create, you know, a lot of the negative health impacts that you talked about, or is it something that can be rectified fairly quickly? Well, I think it's uh, a rectification comes um, from person to person because no one formula applies to everybody. And you asked me uh, in simple terms. In simple terms, I believe in equilibrium, meaning a balance. And let's say we take 24 hours, the balance would be 12 hours for you to be with somebody. And in those 12 hours, you have enough time for you to spend alone, to heal, to meditate, to do yoga, to do whatever you want, that you call it as a uh, me time. And as long as those two worlds are balanced, I believe people can actually make a huge, massive step forward in transforming their loneliness into an interconnected state of being and thinking and behaving. Okay, so what about sleep? So we have like eight hours of sleep. So yes, but again, if you sleep alone and you work another 12 hours alone, that's you out of balance already. Got it. Okay. Most of us understand the yin and yang concept, but 
every time I ask my clients, no matter what the issue is, the yin and yang is out of balance, although they perceive it, it is. Although they perceive it, oh my God, I need to be in balance. But in reality, they are far from it. So, right. you know, it's that balance. I always believe when you have this equilibrium between uh, the different things in your reality, different forms. So if we're talking about loneliness, it will be equilibrium within the loneliness. And if you add that in equilibrium and you strive to do activities that keep that equilibrium, you are already a step ahead of actually healing that. So you talked about the difference between connection and then just like physically being alone. So somebody might say, okay, I, you know, I sleep eight hours and I've got another like 16 hours in the day. I work with a lot of people, you know, in person, it's exhausting, a lot of communication meetings, et cetera. So it's fine that I live alone and just like watch Netflix at night because that's my equilibrium. That's my, you know, downtime. What would you say to that? So, you know, when people say to me like that, I ask them a question saying, okay, I have my partner. Let me substitute you for the night with somebody else. Would you like it? No. And the answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> the answer is no. So it's not a substitute. You know, it's, it's not like having this transactional analysis. It's about really, so if you're going to work and you're doing meaningful work and you are inspired by activities at work and you inspire the people at work, yes, fantastic. But if you're telling me what you said, like uh, somebody says that, you know, I get stressed out with this and that, people engage emotionally in their reality. That on its own is a problem. Because, you know, I can work with 20 clients a day and my energy is the same as I'm with you. It took me years to master the fact that not to engage emotionally with my reality, but to use my emotions intelligently, how to be able to be of service and create a space where true transformation happens. So I see many people being unhappy with their realities, but not being able to pinpoint what exactly is that. So when I work with therapists, with coaches, with speakers, with psychologists, with doctors, uh, they basically come home feeling exhausted because they're taking all of their clients' realities and uh, interact with their own emotions. Forgetting the one most basic things, we're not there to feel for others. We are there to love others. There's a difference. Right. I, yeah, I, I get what you mean. When, when I've had jobs in the past or even just days in my work now where uh, the work feels like a chore or I'm taking on other people's problems or I'm not inspired by that work or, or that day's activities, you feel, I think, 10 times more exhausted because you're not only tired from just the physical nature of maybe a commute and a lot of uh, meetings and, and things like that but just the emotional exhaustion that you feel of not getting that fulfillment, not getting that inspiration. Because actually when you have very inspiring work, like getting to meet interesting people like yourself and, and have these conversations is really an energy add for me. Um, Correct, energy add. Now talking about that, now imagine you're going through that day and imagine you're going home. Imagine your partner, this is why I talk about human energy field in hashtag loneliness. Your partner automatically through his human energy field will be able to sense yours. And unknowingly to him, it will create an issue for him. And some people might be more intuitive and present with you. And some people may be more advanced. So therefore they can help you get out of that state very quickly. But that, most people are not trained to do that. So therefore they contribute to each other's loneliness. And therefore you need more space to be alone because you want to recharge your body. Interesting. I'm starting to see this. Let's say you have a partner that, you know, husband, wife, partner, somebody you live with who is really unhappy in their work. And each night you feel their unhappiness and it's kind of like an energy suck for you as well. Suck for you. Therefore, the body needs more time to recharge. So not only do you need more time to recharge, but that person feels like they need a lot more alone time because they haven't been, they can't get out of this spiral of, uh, you know, Energy and stuff. therefore, there's a disconnect in there because they see each other as a problem, not as a solution. Oh, that's very interesting. Very interesting. Um, so what are some of the most common ways besides not being inspired in your work or not feeling like the relationships that you have are energy adding that we knowingly or unknowingly perpetrate loneliness in our lives? Like, you know, what, what are some of the most common ways? Uh, the first thing is we have this, what I call in my latest book, The Unfakeable Code, Avoiding Behaviors. 
we create many, many avoiding behaviors, meaning anything that reminds us of any pain or unrest or emotion or something we perceive painful, we avoid it. And thus, those avoiding behaviors is one of the biggest, I will say, energy booster for loneliness. Energy booster for, for energy. loneliness. For oh, loneliness. like meaning it makes it uh, boosts it, it, your loneliness even more. Got it. Okay. Okay. So therefore, you are unconsciously want to have some time alone. I see. I see. Okay. That's so interesting. I am uh, very interested in the holistic and holistic mental health and the mind body connection. So I've had some other conversations and guests on uh, the Wellbe show and podcast talking about how our brains want to keep us safe and, you know, going into these painful experiences are very threatening to that equilibrium, to that safety in the brain, because even if something's not that happy, at least they know the brain knows what that is, right? So it's always going to try to get you back to that um, from a safety perspective. I would and like so, to add something before you go forward. Hopefully it sure. will be of service to you and everybody. It's not the brain. It's part of the brain. It's part of the brain. Okay. Which is the amygdala. Okay. The amygdala. Yes. Wants- part of the brain. Because the is- rest of the brain, you know, if we look about the frontal cortex, or, uh, the frontal cortex of your brain is the visionary brain. Uh, that part does not really succumb to your amygdala. It's a whole very different part of the brain that does different functions. So we have the three parts of the brain, the amygdala, uh, and most uh, the other part is what uh, most people uh, call it the monkey brain. Okay, and the monkey brain is all the things that we do automatically without even thinking. And there are many parts in the body that the body does automatically without you thinking how to digest your food. You're not thinking how to digest your food. Your body does it. And then you have the frontal cortex in which where you can create an amazing vision and bring it to life. And the frontal brain does not really think about, am I safe, am I not safe? That's the job of your amygdala. And most of the problems that people have, including chronic disease, it comes from irregulation in the amygdala, what they perceive to be right or wrong. Got it. Okay. Very good distinction. Thank you for clarifying that. So the amygdala is trying to keep you safe, even if that's not in a place you really want to be, right? Like a job you're not inspired by or a relationship that's not really working for you, but it's a relationship, right? So I guess the avoidant behavior, it's amygdala driven. Right. Yes, because basically we're going to, let's say, amygdala has to, uh, like most people talk about the two functions of the amygdala, uh, the freeze and the fight responses. So when the information the body observes all goes through our central nerving system, okay, and it comes to the amygdala, amygdala will tell you whether you should fight or flight. But there is the other part is the freeze part, the freeze response what I call the rabbit or response. If you go into the woods and you have your headlights on, it's mid- midnight dark, you would see that response in animals when head on, the animal will stop and they, it, they don't know which way to go. And we also have that to respond, by the way. But most people don't talk about those responses. That's so interesting. You're so yeah. right. Like you're deer in the road. It you're looks right at road. you. Exactly it that. doesn't know what to do. And you're it always wondering like, do. Why are you not moving? You know, don't you want to die? Correct. Um, Exactly. And this is the part which is very key to transformation of any human being. Because if people in that moment were to understand themselves better and they uh, actually take few breaths, they will make uh, a choice which is uh, driven by the whole intelligence of the body and by your true intuition. We are so quick. That basically, let's say I meet you on the road and let's say I perceive you, you're going to eat me, I will run. So my entire body will make me run. So therefore, we'll engage one part of my immune system that basically will make sure that I eliminate everything I need to eliminate so I'm a a better runner. I can go faster. And let's say uh, you are weak, then I will want to eat you. So we have uh, the amygdala has this straightaway uh, I would say, logical uh, way of looking at things. If you eat me, I run away. If I can eat you, I go and rub you. Now, all of those responses is what splits our psychology. So this is where polarization comes into effect. So most people, uh, the level of polarization is determined how ill the body is. So when the body is ill, 
that psychology is pretty much a lot uh, polarized, meaning they have so many events in the river of life that they perceive more threat and less support or more support than less threat. And when I go through those events and I neutralize those, the body responds with love. Your heart chakra opens up, your states transform. So therefore you influence your past, present and future. Got it. Okay, so we talked about avoidant behaviors and the amygdala. Can you talk about limiting beliefs and how they relate to loneliness? Is that part of the same process? Uh, yes, I mean, we have, like, if you think about it, uh, the functions of the brain, you know, it's uh, beliefs are just one of them. But when we have the most important part of the uh, mind's programming, which is uh, your values. And so therefore, it, uh, the values and belief have a tremendous uh, influence of how lonely you are and how lonely you become or how connected you are and how uh, disconnected you become. So those are two different parts of our psychology because basically a value takes priority. Why? Because if you value something, you will adjust your beliefs to support that value. Meaning, let's say now you're going to become a mother and let's say motherhood is very important to you. All of your beliefs will, will be adjusted around that identity you're going to be evolving. And I talk this quite uh, uh, in detail in my seminars and my coaching programs that I have with my private clients, the importance of evolving your personas and integrating them into one unique identity. Because throughout life, you will create different identities with different personas. And therefore, when you have an identity of a mother, your beliefs, you match, uh, you create beliefs to support your, uh, your value, which is being a mother. And suddenly you'll be drawn to all the people who respect mothers, who know how to raise a child, who know all the best food to have, how to respond and everything else, suddenly your business value will go down, for instance. Or you might turn your entire podcast around how to raise a child, because that now becomes very important to you. So the beliefs, I would say, is best to look at the values than just the beliefs. Got it. So somebody that might uh, feel very lonely might have values that they are actually not living. Correct. And yes. So therefore, they're not really in a state of alignment with their true authentic values, or they might be leaving the value of somebody else, meaning what the society told you, what your parent told you, what your religion told you, what all those external voices, which mean that person will have those voices in their head, but they're not listening to their own voice. And therefore, they'll become lonely. Why? Because they're not listening to their true authentic value. Right. Okay. So, right. The inverse would be true as well, right? If you're, you're, you have values that you're not living or you're living somebody else's values. Values. Yes. This uh, state of loneliness can exist even when you're, you know, technically with people, you know, you're not physically let's alone. Say, let's say your parents want you to live in New York, an example. Okay. But you and your partner always wanted to be somewhere in the, in the nature to raise your children. Now, that voice, if that voice is very strong in you, you'll have internal conflict. And when you have an internal conflict, you already created loneliness. Just a simple example. Yeah, no, that's a great, that's a great example. I am currently trying to figure out, you know, where to live <laughs> in a long-term way and where I want to be to raise a child. And it's very challenging because I have a lot of different values, I think. Uh, well, that's where I say you have conflicting values because most likely your entire psychology is run by many values that you've learned since a, a very child, but never sit down in there and say to yourself, okay, what kind of values are mine without those voices? You know, this is something that when I start people on my uh, five or 10 day vital planning program, I spend a lot of time around that. Why? Because your values will create inspired actions, your authentic values. And therefore, you know, all of those beliefs, all of those, like, to give you an example, I'm very inspired because all of my clients, they have no problem in sharing their stories with the world for the purpose of teaching. So uh, one of the clients, I just finished working 10 days vital planning. She's from America. Uh, she was a teacher and a mother, a single mother, now dating a wonderful guy who come into her life in effect to support her to actually build her business while he's wonderful with her child. Okay. But. Because of all of the problems from the past, when, she, when we started the program, uh, she came here with the idea of uh, creating a new business, with the idea of uh, letting go her teaching career, of everything else. And 10 days down the line, she realized how much she loves her job. 
and it, well, it has nothing to do with uh, other people's values. That was her value, but making her leave was other people's values. And we yeah. clarified that we created such an inspire, uh, inspired vision for her. On top of that, we're going to co create a product for children. What if you have a value of loving culture and experiencing live music and things like that, and that really feeds your soul, but then you know that you also have a value of loving nature and having easily, you know, having easy access to it, but you know that it, there's very few places where you can have both of those things. So how do you reconcile something like that? Well, uh, when I start the work of value with my clients, there's a simple diagram I teach, and those diagrams are two circles. Okay, and one circle is internal reality and the other circle is the external reality. Now, you might think you have a value on something, but if your external reality in this moment when you're speaking to me does not show that, that's not a value. That's an illusion, a fantasy you built in your head. Okay, so an example of that would be like, um, if my external reality, now COVID has made things very challenging, so that's <laughs> tricky, but let's just say it's, you know, pre-COVID, right? And, and you think back to, did my life involve a lot of, culture and you know live music and things like that and if the answer is not really then that's my perception that's not, exactly it's, a it's fantasy. an illusion but it's, it's not illusion. the external reality yes. or i say i love nature but you know a lot of weekends i am walking around the city instead of accessing it when i could you're have going shopping you're going shopping you're going to coffee shop you're going to restaurants you know you're doing right. those amazing things but you keep telling yourself i love nature right oh that's so smart i, I love that show evidence so this is what I do with all my clients. I break down all the entire psychology. And when they get it to see it clearly and they can uh, uh, reconcile those two realities, we can harmonize the entire life and uh, create any results my clients give me. And then right. I can create new value system for them that is in alignment with what whatever vision I want to create for their life. Right. Okay, so this has been so interesting and I feel a tremendous responsibility to make sure that everybody listening to this that feels lonely in some way, mental, emotional, physical, loneliness. Financial, you know, a lot of people don't financial. realize how important financial loneliness is. Why? You know, once I worked with a client about this, you know what I did? I'm not sure. Have you been to London? Yes. Okay. I took her to New Bond Street with all the most amazing shops. She was a client who kept telling me money is not important to her. But on the other hand, she wanted good clothes. So, and on the other hand, she, she did not connect how that made her extremely lonely, her ability not to be able to purchase whatever she wanted. Uh, we did the coaching, the whole day of coaching, taking her into the most expensive shops and observing her reaction and just asking her questions until the penny dropped for her, how important it was for her to become financially free. That's so interesting. Yeah, uh, I see now what you mean by financial loneliness. It's a, it's the same idea of what you were talking about before that. It's a perception versus reality or what you want to believe. Like, I don't need material things, but then your external reality is you end up window shopping all the time because you really want Correct. some material but people things. people deny that. They even deny the fact that they do that. And I've well, had clients who deny that and I go with them. I said, okay, you take me around, uh, for the day. Tell me what you do during the day. And by, by the end of the evening, they got the answer. Yeah. How delusional they become with their reality. So really, the more we're talking about it, the more loneliness of all the kinds you, that you've just mentioned is a disconnection from value. The true self. The true yeah. self. Which we know is the root cause of so many chronic illnesses Problems. and things yes. like that. Um, but so how do people pull themselves out of loneliness? Like whether they realize they're in it or not, because I think, like you said, some people live alone and, you know, maybe it's a 27 year old guy, right. And he's not ready to get married. And maybe he's had a couple of relationships here and there, but he's building his career and he doesn't feel lonely. He has friends, he has colleagues, he dates here and there, but he's okay with living alone right now, that kind of thing. So, um, you know, how do people get out of it that don't want to be in it, that want a partner? And how do other people think about it that feel like it's fine for them? Well, look, again, we're going back to uh, the things we've been discussing. The key is psychology. And within the psychology, the key is to know your true authentic values. Because when you know those true authentic values, you have this crucifix within yourself. 
of actually by what values you want to live your day-to-day -day life. By what values do you want to uh, create actions during the day? By what values do you want to, you know, uh, go to work? You know, most people, they don't have these alignments in values in their own life. So the first step is really clarifying that and looking at where there is discrepancy and looking at which value is priority to you. Because our values are not something that are fixed. Most people treat values saying, oh, I'm like this. I've always been like this. That's the biggest illusion people create for themselves. So I'm very good at listening to people's language. So one of the principles within A Path to Wisdom is the methodology which I trademark globally now. In each book, I've created different methodologies. Why? Because what I said to you earlier, 30 years I spent into research, studies, science, psychology, spirituality, cosmology, um, mathematics, uh, quantum physics, and various healing modalities. And one of the key things I wanted to do, I wanted to create a solution that harmonizes those different things and makes it simple for people to follow. Now, within the methodology, when I created uh, TGSE method, evolutionary method, alarm, alarm simply represents alarming you when you're not in alignment with your true authentic self and with your values, with your soul's mission, vision, and purpose in life. And anything outside of that makes you lonely and makes you go into all those different states that uh, are countless for different people, whether it's depression, whether it's chronic illness, whether it's divorce, it, it does not matter where it is. It's matter that you are out of that crucifix within yourself that you know you want. And most people find it very difficult to clarify what is it that they want. So start with that. I have two different questions for you and I can't decide which one is more important to ask right now, but <laughs> I'll just go with this one. What is the root cause, do you think, of not being able to clarify your vision or your real values? Well, not all of us have been taught psychology. You know, we all have a different calling in life. You know, if you are somebody who, let's say, a lot of women, they just want to be mothers, good mothers to their children. So therefore, they, they're not going to spend time studying and researching how the brain works. They're going to spend time in researching how the family works, how they can provide for their children. So, you know, it's uh, the first thing is really understanding. This is why it's important to understand what is it you're calling? What is this value? And when you say about what is the problem, the problem is this, very simple. If I take nature, you know, when people tell me I don't need anybody to, I know everything. Oh, wow. Okay. So if you know everything, if you, you know, uh, why, are you, why are you asking for advice? Why are you learning? Why are you growing? And then they give you the, uh, the stories behind that. Behind every story, there's authenticity. But most people don't see that. Like same as we have the planet. You know, it took a man to take all the minerals from the planet and everything we have and to create cities, to create every technology we have. The earth did not give it to us. Same way, your body is not going to give it to you unless you have somebody who can masterfully extract exactly what is it that you want and then help you create a detailed plan how to, how to achieve it. All right, so more concretely, how can people shift out of loneliness, you know, if that's been their de facto way of living or being for quite some time. Uh, like I said, whether that's somebody that's physically lonely, like living alone, not in a relationship, working alone, et cetera, or somebody surrounded by people all the time, but just feels lonely in one of the ways that you mentioned, like, what are, what are the first concrete steps, you know, after you establish your values and you actually connect to your truest self and you say, my society has told me that, you know, working in finance is the de facto way I should live my life. But I know that working with children is the way that I want to live my life or whatever it is. So you've established that. But like day well, to day. Wait, wait, wait. They said it's, it's not as simple as that. Why? Because most people, even when they establish, they establish illusional, delusional and uh, things that are not real. For instance, the question in there, you, we said, okay, I work in finance and I want to work with children. The question I would pose as a coach, what credibility do you have? Because most people want to go into something with zero credibility. And therefore, they're creating more resistance, more loneliness. Why? Because somebody who's an expert in it will overpower you. So you're not in the equal power. My client came in here with the idea to leave her teaching profession, walked back with the idea how to grow the profession and feel fulfilled. So I'm very careful to say anything. Uh, that's why I say, you know, you can't move to step two if your first step is not correctly done. So I, I would encourage people, do that step first. Get clear with that, because when you get clear with that, you're not going to go into things which are not in alignment with what you are capable of doing. 
you know, I had a, a guy who called himself a business coach. So in two hours, I break his entire delusion. Why? Because he's never been working in a business. He worked in restaurants as a waiter. Okay, so you can't go just because you've got a quick qualification as a business coach. You're going to set up business coaching with zero experience in business. But okay. what we did is he actually could coach waiters, how to become great waiters. He could coach the restaurant, how he could actually uh, attract better staff to wait. So suddenly we turned the coaching concept into something that is credible. You've established what your values are and you've established what's uh, external versus internal and all of that. And you wake up the next day, but you're still living alone. Well, that's not true because then you haven't established those things because if you did, you would have inspired actions against those and you wake up next day and you take those actions. Okay, so basically the shift out of loneliness is taking inspired action. Yes, with after establishing the journey of actually what is authentically you want to do, what is your authentic true value? And then within that, so I always encourage people, I, when I sit down and work with people, I work out spiritually, mentally, emotionally, physically, which is your physical body and physical environment, in business or career, financially, and socially. And then you look at all of that, how, what is it the key factor that connects all of that for you? And there is always a key factor, authentic factor that brings you all together and you know exactly what to do. And when you have that clarity, the steps, the inspired actions comes automatically out of that. So a lot of times when we read about solutions for chronic loneliness, because this is something that at Wellbe we've talked about before and looked at research before, a lot of the suggestions are, you know, joining a faith-based community or uh some sort of hobby, right? Like if you love tennis, can you join a tennis group? Can you can you connect with people? With that a dog, way? for instance. So you know, uh, or get a dog and meet people walking yeah, the dog that way, and stuff like that. Or be in service of some way, volunteer, etc. So, do you recommend, based on you know writing this whole book on loneliness and all of your research, that people take those actions as well, or it's really about getting this framework of your authentic self? Mostly it sounds like around career or just like, you know, purpose and not so much these other things that I just mentioned. Or do you say to do those as well? Well, the question I would ask firstly, do you want a long-term solution or do you want a short-term gain and long-term pain? I mean, it sounds like the right answer is a long-term solution here. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I don't believe in right or wrong answer because as I said, different people might be at different stages of their development. So therefore they might not be ready to make that big jump. They might just need something, a small step before actually they can even think on the second step, which means they might just need a dog to start getting them out of that lonely space. And then right. as they get comfortable with a dog, saying, okay, now I have the dog, now I can do this. How about if I meet a friend with a dog? So it's all very, uh, I would say, uh, solution based on the individual. Because, you know, people have different needs and people have unique values. Your values, the way your body works, is as unique as your uh, retina, as un unique as your fingerprint. And this is why uh, uh, when I work with clients, every time I work with clients, every month, we actually go back and revalue all of their values. And is it still in alignment with the reality they're in in that moment? So, you know, somebody who's done a lot of personal development might be very easy to take our conversation and take action steps. But somebody who's depressed, clinically depressed, somebody who's been taking medication for 22 years, this conversation means nothing to them. You know, uh, an example, I've, I've worked with people with OCT, with epilepsy. I have a client, uh, Paul McMonagall, who is one of my uh, key students and models that now he's bringing my work to in inspire mental health in oil and gas in industry. You know, when I first met him, he was about to commit suicide. I could not, you know, bring him the intelligence I have for 30 years in one session. It's like you putting your phone into high power. You know, the power that, that goes through from one city to another with thousands of voltage and expect the phone will charge. No, it will burn. Wisdom is the same. It can burn you if you don't have the capacity to channel that wisdom in a way that can support you through the next steps. So therefore, uh, I always very careful to recommend people one pill for all. No, people are individual and I don't really give advice until the client works with me. Why? Because that client has a very specific psychology that brought them into that reality they currently are experiencing.
And I use the words very carefully, currently. Why? Because every step changes. I very much believe in that. Some people, the exercise of figuring out their true values and their highest self would be completely terrifying and debilitating Correct. and maybe even send them into a spiral uh, of depression. Even worse. Correct. It could have a, a counterintuitive effect. And right. that's why I always say to people, especially people who work with clients, when I mentor and coach people who work with people, you need to be very, uh, I would say, intelligent in the way you deal with clients and be able to foresee the different possibilities for that client in their psychology, not in yours. And where somebody is, like meet them where they are, you know, really understanding Correct. if somebody's Simple not able way. to meet talk them about where they something. Are, but create a space in which they feel safe to make the first step. For some people, like you said, picking up one volunteering activity or getting a dog might be what the leads them yes. to be able to really understand and have a conversation with themselves about their true values and self because they've broken down a couple of barriers first to connecting with others and things like that. And maybe it takes two more years, but that could be what helps them get there. Um, or is yeah. at least, like you said, a short-term solution to not feeling quite as lonely and then they can you know, take other steps yes. after that. Uh, uh, last year, I worked with a celebrity client uh, and I went to Turkey to work because of COVID and all of that. Now, despite having everything, okay, she was feeling suicidal and had issues with addictions. So me, I can be very challenging, but in a very safe way. I took my clients to one of the biggest bridges and I asked her, I said, okay, jump if you want to kill yourself. Guess what? She didn't. She started laughing. She went like, oh, I didn't mean, I didn't mean that. But I said, whole morning you can be telling me you have suicidal thoughts and you want to jump, you want to end your life. Oh, but I didn't mean it like that. <laughs> you know, now that you put it, I want to live. Simply bringing her to the bridge, making her face what she's saying, she changed her psychology. But if you take somebody who's clinically ill, and taking medication for 20 years, they will jump. So again, you need to be very careful of actually how you deal with the clients because if the client is ready to truly make a breakthrough, they'll do anything it requires for them to make that breakthrough. Wow, so much here. All right, so we're, we're running out of time, but I wanna shift to kind of the state that we're in right now, all of our external reality, You know, having just gone through this major global pandemic, and with social media and technology where it is today, and I think both of us can see the writing on the wall, it's only going to get worse. Social media can have profound power, actually, of connection, right, um, as we've seen, but it can be very detrimental as well. So how do you advise people use social media? Like, Does that count in certain ways to combat loneliness if somebody were to have no other connection, but now they're making friends via Instagram, commenting and DMs and things like that, um, or playing War of Warcraft or something and making friends through the video game or whatever? Um, or do you really suggest, you know, if you want to kick loneliness, you've got to do things offline? Well, going back again, I, I'm a person who actually always looks into the balance of things. Now, technology, I've been interviewed on many TV shows about technology, and also I've got a TED talk called Technological Armageddon, The Wake Up Call. And I, uh, unfortunately, we introduced a tool in the last 20 years that most people's psychologists weren't ready for that tool. And this is why we're having the issues we have now, and they continue to develop even further. Why? Because technology is not used intelligently for them in their own reality. A smart person, a wise person, would use technology for them as an extension to their reality, but not dependent and codependent on technology. Now, we've created a whole new generation that depend on likes. You know, we've created people being depressed if somebody does not like their posts. In the next 10 years, there'll be even more research around how technology has negatively impacted mental health, emotional health, financial well-being, everything, like connection between one another. Because, you, you know, people go on Facebook or uh, Instagram and show themselves. But I also know clients, famous people, who are nowhere near to what their Instagram shows and what their social media shows. So we keep, I would say, uh, fueling this uh, disintegrated persona within ourselves, and we put a heavy mask like the carnival in, in Venice. I talk about it in the unpeakable quote about the amount of mask we put in just to have this social acceptance. Now, on the other hand, the positive side of technology can create things like me and you. You know, we can use it consciously to actually really 
uh, empower and help people and feed information out there that may be helpful for a specific individual. You know, through COVID, technology was used. We had so much digital transformation happening where people could continue the education system, where people get informed about certain things, whether it's safe or not. So technology, like everything else in life, has the curse and has the blessing. But again, what decides it's your psychology, how you use those. So how do you responsibly draw that line? Because, you know, I, I have to use technology and social media for work, but I'm a human being and I am susceptible to a lot of the big tech tricks, I, I think, to get you to spend more time on there, right? I know, you know, intuitively that I can use it for a certain purpose and that I really shouldn't just be on my phone to scroll, but rather to use it for something. But sometimes I'll even know that say, I need to go on my phone to look up uh, where we're going for this or that. And the next thing I know, I'm on Instagram scrolling. (laughs) And I don't know how I got there. And it's like (laughs) an out-of-body experience. And this is somebody who's aware, right, of all the dangers and really tries to use it intentionally and really tries not to spend too much time on it. So what is, you know, how much is that happening for other people that aren't aware or aren't conscious? So how do we really draw that line. I know you said there's a balance, but how do you how do you protect yourself from this, you know, addictive nature of technology and social media? I will give you a very powerful phrase. I want you to write it somewhere. And hopefully people will write it as a mantra. Stop being a slave to your habits. Okay. <laughs> Enough said. It's very simple. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you're right. You're right. Okay. Well, that one's pretty straightforward. Um, so, so another question on the topic of technology for you by, by the, uh, you know, a year or even six months into the pandemic, um, there was a lot of zoom socializing going on and, um, in certain ways it was really nice and fun occasionally, but after a while, it just felt draining to me. And so the idea of a zoom hangout with some friends felt draining instead of, fun the way that getting together for dinner with them would feel fun. Um, And so should we still be trying to do this Zoom socializing as a way to, you know, maybe short term combat some loneliness or, you know, minimize it a little bit? Or if it feels draining, is it going to be draining? And I should just say, you know, no, thanks. Well, again, we're going back into individual circumstances. And basically, what is it that you feel lonely about? Because, you know, it's sort of when you understand the kind of form of loneliness that uh, you may be experiencing, you can also have an, a simple action that takes you away from that without even having to use technology. This is why it's so important is to identify what is the form that loneliness shows up in your life. So this is a question for anybody listening to this podcast to really write it down and really sit down and have to spend some time. What is the form that loneliness show up, shows up in my life? And that on its own will reveal a lot of answers. Now, while technology is great, I love social interactions. You know, I grew up in a, in a family with six children. And then my both parents had seven and six. And I had about hundreds, thousands of cousins. So I grew up being in that environment. Now, although a pandemic has happened, uh, you know, although we had to go back into isolation, yes, this Zoom was fine for me for a bit. But the moment the the society opened up, I started traveling and doing my teaching because most of the time uh, I socialize with is with my clients. Why? Because they are at the same uh, resonance and vibration. And I feel alive, me living my own authentic values and being with people who live their authentic values and have value on learning, growth and success and wealth and purpose in life. So, you know, it's all depends who you socialize with. You know, there's that saying about you, you become the person of, five or 10 people you socialize with. Now, if say maximizing your human potential is very important to you, you're gonna start finding those people and you're gonna start investing in the people who can help you achieve that. So then my social sector is pretty much my clients, my partner, my family, and close friends who are also into growth and also support my work. And I support theirs. So this is how important it is to have this environment in which you can thrive naturally in what you are good at. I'm good at teaching. I'm good at speaking. I'm good at training people. I'm good at resolving problems. I'm an engineer. So therefore, I always see things, how to solve problems. So, you know, I'm not good at raising kids. Otherwise, I would be a gay man. You know, most likely I'll be a woman or a man who wants to have 
20 children. You know, I love children. I love educating children. But would I see myself sitting in there changing nappies? The answer is no. And most people try to do things which are not really inspiring for them. You know, I worked with parents where they felt ashamed admitting that parenting is hard. They felt ashamed admitting and saying, you know, sometimes I, not, I wish they never came into this world. But this is what's going on in people's minds. Now, if as a parent, you tr try to silence this voice, you're just going to become a frustrated parent. And that frustration through the human energy field will go on into your child. So that your child will learn to have the same frustrations as you. So you're not really breaking that cycle. Although you think the child does not understand. No, that child is a full intelligence system that keeps growing and absorbing information before you even think that they, they know. This is all so interesting. I have so many different ways that we can take this, but I think we're running out of time. So I have to just ask you maybe one or two more questions and then we got to wrap up. For people that in a short-term way know they're going to be sort of stuck in a lonely situation, you know, and we've mm -hmm. talked about how there's many different kinds of loneliness and you cannot feel lonely and be alone. But let's just say somebody has to be alone because they are studying hard for an exam for the next six months or um, they are, you know, there's a pandemic and, you know, whatever it is. What is your advice to people in that place to both feel better in a quicker way um, and feel less of the effects of loneliness, um, but also to try to make this long-term solution stick where you get more in touch with your authentic self and do it in the way that's right for them. Like, how do you put, put one foot in front of another? Because I think people are so paralyzed by mm -hmm. the, the sadness that loneliness brings that mm -hmm. inspired action doesn't come naturally. It doesn't. <laughs> that's why I said earlier on, you know, it's, it, it all needs to be at the step they're comfortable with. For instance, if I take the example you gave about somebody studying for an important exam. So the first thing I would do is find other people who are studying for the same exam. Because that not only helps you, you help them as well. And you still achieve the end goal, which is passing the exam. So, you know, there's always somebody out there who might be heading towards the direction you're heading. Let's say, I mean, there have been many elderly people who couldn't see their families during the pandemic. But, you know, elderly people, most of the people in this country, they are in elderly homes. So therefore, they have an elderly care. So therefore, you can actually instruct the elderly care to put the phone up and have a Zoom meeting. So this is where technology can be a great resource if it is the last option. But if you're not in pandemic, you know, look at about doing things outdoor and get yourself out of the environment in which you feel lonely. So that environment could also uh, start with your own home, could start with your own office, could start with the family. You know, sometimes you're uh, alone with the family. They all speak blah, 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 and you're not even interested. What, what's, what is being said? Or most of us did not grow up with intelligent, emotionally intelligent parents. So therefore, they have no awareness of understanding our emotions. The only thing they're going to do is they're going to project their values on us and expect us to conform and become like them. Yes. Okay? So the first thing is really is change the environment in which you feel lonely. So it might even be go for a brisk walk. It might even be it's like, you know, uh, go to a local coffee shop where you know the person who serves you coffee. So there are so many different things the person can do, but go back to what is it exactly that creates that loneliness and then take an action which is in alignment with that. If the, your family is uh, uh, full of, um, you know, in my case, there are members of my family who are homophobic. So if I go uh, be with them, of course I'm going to feel lonely because they have no conception about, first of all, understanding me as a human being, two, understanding themselves as a human being, and three, understanding that everybody is authentic. If you understand that everybody is authentic, you don't have problems with black, white, green, yellow, uh, Israel, Palestine, Americans, uh, what, uh, gay, straight. No. You actually love people. I love people. I don't care where you come from or what you subscribe to. I will always find a way to, uh, to communicate with you and connect with you. But that needs to happen with another human being who has the same kind of um, mindset in putting importance with something that's important to both of us, which is connection, and find how we can use our backgrounds to create something new and be amazing. Yeah, so I, you've worked with so many private clients now at this point, and I'm sure you've had some cases where you thought, I'm not sure I'm ever going to get this person out of loneliness, right? Like they're really alone um, and have a lot of resistance to the things that might work to get them to be out of, you know, loneliness. Are there a handful or even one thing that you've seen really changes 
the situation for them? Um, and what would that be? Yes, a powerful question. Powerful question that addresses the root cause of their loneliness. An example, I work with a very wealthy couple uh, on their business. And in reality, the couple did not really love each other and they didn't have intimate relationship for most, more than nine months. So the woman created the delusion how much she loves the husband. And I asked her a simple question, is sex important to you? She went like, yeah. So I said, when was last time your husband touched you and had sex with you? And that was it. She broke down. So all the masks she's built with herself, with her children, with her husband, with her people around her. And she looked at me and she went like, wow. And she was crying for like two hours with me. Acknowledging that on its own broke her loneliness. So it's a return to this authentic yeah, it's the return to reality. It's it's seeing your life and your situation and your values for what they really are and not trying not to- Not for what you think they are, yes. Not for what you think they are. Okay, all right. That's, that's the first advice. thing, breaking that illusion. Yeah, I think that's kind of the answer to everything. So <laughs> that's yes. a good place to I mean, wrap I'm up. I'm not sure if you've seen it, but with another client of mine, with Joel and Timia, we actually co-created a documentary called Living My Illusion, which is on Amazon. And we call it The Truth Hurts. And this is the part where basically when I bring people into reality of actually understanding what their reality is really speaking to them, this is the part where it hurts them the most because they suddenly feel dumb. Like, you know, they feel ashamed of themselves. How on earth did they allow themselves to come to this point? And then they start the self-judgment road to start with. But it is important to acknowledge that. Why? Because it will free you to be able to make the next step. Yeah, it's the seeing of yourself or what you really are without judgment is freedom, I think. Yes, um, that's the definition of freedom in the unfakeable code and how to live freely on your terms, meaning using objectivity, but not attaching emotion to it. You know, the moment we uh, uh, polarize things, we already attach the meaning and, and an emotion to that, which means you're not in a state of grace and gratitude and love. And if you're not in a state of gratitude and grace and love, your body will respond, you'll end up being ill bottom line. That's exactly right. I'm glad that you brought it back to uh, being ill and chronic illness and symptoms, because that's certainly a focus for, uh, you know, a lot of what I do at Wellbe. But this conversation has been so fascinating. I feel like I have just endless ideas about things I want to dig into with family members and myself and, you know, people I love to make sure that we get out of this autopilot state of, you know, trying to ignore our own reality or, or living somebody else's truth um, because all the different problems that I've seen that relate to physical illness and mental and emotional and spiritual, it's all so, so connected. There's no way to separate them. And I'm currently uh, running a program that I co-partnered with a woman named Kelly Gores, who did a documentary called the heal documentary, all about how to, you know, go on a roadmap to healing. And so much of healing is really the mind body work and people don't think it's a psychology course and it's not. Um, a lot of it has to do with, you know, navigating the healthcare system and things that I have mm -hmm. expertise in, but you can't ignore that part. There's just no way. So connected. We are all connected in whichever way. And this is why I don't promote polarized politics where basically a politician needs to be better by, uh, you know, speaking badly about another politician or for instance, what happened here in Britain about Brexit, you know, uh, I still don't see how by us removing ourselves from our trading, biggest trading partner, it's good for us. You know, most people live the illusion, they created the illusion based on lies. Now, when you create an illusion based on lies, we have a saying in North Macedonia uh, that my parents brought me up, if, uh, lies have short legs, eventually you get caught. That starts the lies we tell ourselves and the lies we tell the world. There's no way to lie to your own body. You know, it's just creating an, a state of internal conflict. Um, in the, well, in the latest book, uh, there's a chapter that starts, take off the mask, your soul is waiting. Yeah. Oh, I love that. Well, Tony, thank you so much for this. I'm just overwhelmed with thoughts about how I can help others, how I can help myself, uh, people I know, people I don't, you know, everybody listening to this. Um, as far as this, you know, issue we've identified of chronic loneliness, both pandemic related and before that, 
and the chronic disease epidemic, certainly in America and the Western world, but expanding everywhere. It has a lot of root causes, but this disconnection to our authentic self and you know, not taking the mask off um, is certainly the root of it. And if we can do that, we can have such profound change. So thank you again for sharing all of this. Thank you from the bottom of my heart, having me on your podcast and being of service to as many people globally as I can. What's the best way for people in the Wellbe community to access more of your information? Uh, the best way is to go to my website, which is uh, tonyselimi.com, T O N Y S E L I M I dot com. And in there, they have links to all of my social media. They connect with me on social media. And also, there's some free content that they, they can read quite a lot about it. And also, what I can do for them, for their families, business, and humanity. Awesome. All right. Thank you so much, Tony. Thank you for joining uh, from London. And uh, have a wonderful day. Be blessed. <laughs>